Hi, I'm Louise Shaner from the Hutchins Center, and I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel on state and local retirement benefits, not only because I'm thrilled to catch up with Alicia, who I worked with 20 years ago at the Council of Economic Advisors, but because uh, I think it's such a great topic. As David explained this morning, one of the reasons that we were so interested in bringing this conference to Brookings is that we have sort of had this longstanding desire to promote research in the state and local area. We wanted to get into it more. There's, you know, being in Washington, there's so much attention to fiscal issues from the federal perspective. You know, we've got agencies like CBO and OMB and Social Security and people like me and countless others all sort of examining every, the nitty-gritty of the long-term uh, outlook for the federal government. And I'm going to just plug something uh, that we've done here at Hutchins. So we actually, uh, along with the Wilson Center, have developed a video game called The Fiscal Ship. I think you have a flyer inside your... Uh, your um, uh, agenda uh, net, um, notebook. Um, that it's a it's a video game that's intended. To, you can choose policies to try to write the uh, fiscal ship to get the government the long term uh, fiscal outlook on a sustainable path for the federal government. Okay, but there's so little out there thinking about these issues from the state and local governments. Right? It's always we always think federal, very little on state and local, and. One of the reasons, which you'll see from Elise's paper, is it's incredibly difficult. My federal government's really easy. There's great data. It's one government. We all know the programs. When you go into state and local, you're not only just talking about 50 states, but so much activity, as you all know, is at sub-state levels that if you really want to get a decent picture, you have to work really, really hard gathering data from disparate sources uh, and putting them on together, and uh, it's a lot of work. So... Um, uh, one of the reasons we're really pleased to have Lisa's paper here is because they've actually done this incredible work and uh, made a really huge contribution, I think, to our understanding of the state of uh, fiscal pressure on the state and local governments, which I'm sure will be very useful for many researchers for years ahead, coming to then try to kind of analyze it. But uh, just doing the first work of getting the data is incredibly difficult. Uh, so uh, Elise is going to present, uh, and her co-author, JP, will be here to answer questions. Is that right? Uh, um, and then uh, we have a discussion. We're lucky to have um, Clint Zweifel from uh, Missouri uh, discussing uh, the paper. So, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Louise. I'm delighted to be here, as is JP. Um, Full disclosure, we are pension experts. We don't know much about municipal finance, and one of the reasons we came is we wanted to learn, and we've learned a lot already. But uh, So our job now is to uh, address the pension issue. It's been creeping into the conversation over the morning, and it's time to talk about it uh, up front. So the way it's usually talked about is that people generalize. They look at the state pension unfunded liability and they go, oh my God, it's so big, we have to do something. And then they discount it by an even lower rate and it gets even bigger and then people just pull out their hair and they say this is a terrible situation. Um, looking at pension, uh, state pension costs in the aggregate fails on two grounds. Um, First, it's too narrow uh, to capture costs because uh, they're not only state uh, their pensions, but they're also other employee, uh, other post-employment benefits, which is basically retiree health, and then people have uh, fixed uh, interest rate payments. There's not also more than states. There are counties, as they were saying, as Louise was saying, uh, and there are cities. There are also school districts, <laughs> which have come up a lot today, um, but we're not going to uh, address them just because there's so many of them and we weren't really sure of our numbers. Um, and, and so on the one hand, aggregating is too narrow um, and focusing on states and pensions is too narrow. On the other hand, it's um, too broad to inform policy. And so what this chart shows you is the ARC, the annual required contribution uh, in, for the three most expensive states and the annual required contribution for the three least expensive states. And you can see the average is 4.3% uh, of uh, own source revenues. And so to talk about anything in the aggregate, when you have this great amount of heterogeneity, and I think as um, Bob Doty was saying this morning, just doesn't make any sense at all. So what we do need to do is we need to look at the costs of plans at the individual level. So we need a much more uh, granular, granular um, gander on this whole thing. So we have a sample of um, 
uh, state plans um, and uh, that really cover 100% of state payrolls. We have a, a sample of 175 uh, county plans that cover about half of county payrolls and about uh, 175 cities that cover about 43% of payrolls, and it's based on those uh, data, that sample, that will present the, the results. But you have to, before you start, you have to figure out um, what cost burden, how are you going to define cost burden? Um, so there are three components to this, three steps. One, you have to apply GASB 68, and for those of you who don't live in the uh, weeds the way we do. That's a GASB is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, and 68 is a new regulation or um, whatever. And it basically says that uh, for uh, cost sharing plans, um, the, the, uh, where states participate, I mean, cities participate in a state plan or counties participate in a state plan, you have to allocate the costs the liabilities and the assets back to the responsible government. So first of all, we have to do that. Then we have to decide how we want to define expense. And that has involved several substeps. And then we need to choose some metric that we want to compare these costs to, sort of what revenue base makes sense. So starting with um, GASB 68, uh, this is our little schematic of you have a plan here for state public employees, and of course state government workers participate, but so do county governments and city governments, and the idea is you want to get the costs allocated to, from the state to these county and city governments in a way um, that makes sense. So this, legis this ruling or statute, or what is it? Standard. What? The standard. Standard. <laughs> standard. This standard came in in 2014. Um, in 2015, this happens, is the plans themselves are reporting their shares. We're, our data is for 2014 because we want to do it not only for states, we want to do it for localities as well. And the most recent locality data is 2014. So that means that we had to estimate um, how much belongs to the state and how much belongs to the city and county governments. And so it's really interesting um, how it changes the pattern of liability. If you look at this chart, the red lines are where the liability rests if you look by level of administration. And so it looks like this is a state system. All the burden, 85% of the liability is at the state level. Once you go through and GASB 68 it, you see that it's distributed um, among states, counties, and cities and school districts sort of roughly, a little, roughly equally. So the second step is calculating expenses. So one important thing here is what are you going to di um, discount future uh, promises by? And in uh, the way the plans do it, they do it on the assumed long-run rate of return. And there's a whole debate of whether that should be done with the riskless rate or whatever, which is fine for reporting. But I think for funding, I think the long-run um, assumed rate of return makes sense. And so the question is, what number should that be? And then the question is, you have this unfunded liability. How are you going to pay that off? So the first issue is the discount rate. And basically, the rates that these plans use today run from about 6.5 to 8.2. But the average is 7.6%. And if you look historically, that doesn't look so crazy. If you have a portfolio 35% of bonds, 65% of stocks, you can see that over a rolling average over 10 years or 30 years has generally exceeded um, that rate of return. But um, going forward, it's an uh, understatement to say that we're in a low interest rate environment. And uh, the financial experts have all put out forecasts that have much lower rate of returns. So we have to pick a number. And being great intellectuals that we are, we decided to follow Michael Semblist at J.P. Morgan because he does um, this very nice piece, The Ark and the Covenant. And he uses 6.6% 6 um, 
discount rate. We're actually taking his format. It, we're doing an unacademic thing. We're not trying to be more original or trying to use a different rate. We're trying to build on what he did and expand. So we, our rate is consistent with his. Um, in terms of amortization, the question is how are you going to pay off the unfunded liability the plans have? So what some plans do is they say, oh, I'm going to pay off a certain amount as a percent of payroll over the next 30 years. So they start doing that, and then in the first year, they start a new 30-year period. And then the second year, they start a new 30-year period. So what that means is even if all their assumptions come true, they're never going to get to 100% funding. So what we opt for is level dollar amount and a closed 30-year um, period. So the final step in setting up these calculations is, what do we put this over? What do we divide by? And the question is, do you use own source revenue or uh, total revenue? And um, at the state level, it really doesn't matter because the state sort of sends out about the same amount of money that it gets in. But it really matters at the county and city level. And so the decision we've made, although if you look at the paper, we've done it every once, once way, is to um, use own source revenue. First of all, then we can um, compare to Zemblis. And we're using it for the county and city um, plans as well. So this will make the burdens look higher than they are. But the rationale is not just to be consistent with Zemblis, is that, that if you're going to have to raise additional money, then you're probably going to come out of your own source revenue. It doesn't seem like transfers are going to make up for the difference. Okay, so that's the setup. Here are the results. Now, if you have, I think this paper must be on the website, um, I hope, uh, because it's hard to see, but those little things at the bottom are the names of the states. <laughs> so the first thing, and I can read them for you. Um, the first thing is that uh, shows we start with states, and we look just at pension costs as a percent of all own source revenues. It calculated our way with a 6% discount rate and this 30-year closed amortization. And you can see at this left end, the high ones are Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut, Hawaii, uh, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware. And so those are the ones to look at as we build. The next stay, step is to look at OPEB costs. Now, again, remember what OPEB is, retiree health insurance, essentially. And there's um, just a couple of things about it. One is um, the unfunded liabilities of OPEB amount to about 28% of the unfunded liabilities of pensions. And they're not as scary because there's more flexibility in terms of changing benefits over time. And also, as the retirement age uh, expands, extends, um, you're left with less expenditure for people who are below 65. They're the expensive people because after 65, really Medicare uh, serves as the base. So yes, they have high costs, um, but they're... Small, small compared to pensions, and they're more uh, flexible. The other thing you note at the, in this one is that I keep the names the same as you go along, so all you have to do is see the pattern. You don't really need to see that. But you can see that the same states that have high pension costs also have high OPEB costs. So again, you're Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut, Hawaii, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware. So then we add to this um, interest payments. So now we have pensions, we have OPEB, and we have interest payments. Now you might say, what are those lines? Those are um, J.P. Morgan lines. And essentially, as I understand it, since I, this is not my business, um, that if, this, if your costs, these fixed costs that you have to pay, exceed 15%, you really are worth the uh, um, sort of investigation. And after it exceeds 25%, I think the consensus is that, I think the technical term is basket case. <laughs> and so you can see 
um, that Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut are just really um, extraordinarily high. But then you also have um, Hawaii, uh, Kentucky, and Massachusetts um, just under there. The next chart is the same chart. It just shows you the, what makes up these components. So the red line is the required pension payment. The beige, bluey-gray bluey gray line is the required OPEB payment. And then the stripe line is the debt service. So what I've done is I've taken you through the um, state adding one component after another. You'll be very happy to know that I'm not going to do the same thing uh, for the counties and uh, cities, but I'm going to show you the final answer. Um, so here are the comparable results for counties. And you can see they're sort of interesting. There are a lot of California counties there. Um, the, remember that I said um, that own source revenues are only 60%, 67% of total revenues for the county. So this overstates them in some, some way, um, but those are high, high numbers. And I was, I'm just always amazed at how many, uh, well, count, counties are only important in Virginia, Maryland, and uh, California, maybe Pennsylvania. Yeah, but that's that. And then the next one is for cities. And I think this one is really interesting. This, is, again, is the final uh, tally. And so I'll read some of these for you, not the all 50. Um, sh makes you want to read the paper, right? So, so. <laughs> Chicago, Detroit, no surprises, right? San Jose, Miami, I didn't know. Houston, Baltimore. And we have to talk to some of you guys in the audience because we have Wichita here, here, and I don't know what's happened in Wichita, but they have an awful lot of bond payments, and we're a little worried that it has something, they've misclassified industrial revenue bond or something like that. But anyway, the, the, it's interesting um, as you look through there. So the question is, um, but I mean, let, let's just go to the conclusion. The conclusion is that you really can't just put all these plans together and uh, say, oh my God, it's so big. Um, you really have to look at these um, plan by plan, state by state, city by city, county by county. And then we probably actually should go back and do some aggregation in terms of the subcategories of, let's say, uh, uh, California. And what you see is there are a lot of states and a lot of cities where everything's really quite fine. They have reasonable pension benefits. They make their contributions, and they're not um, their expenses aren't outlandish. And then we have a few cases that are really, really worrisome. And what are you going to do? They they can pray for higher returns. They can raise employee contributions. They can raise taxes. They can cut back other uh, other expenditures. But it's really hard to figure out um, uh, what is going to be the solution for the really uh, tough situations. So that's my story. Zero, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Well, it is... First of all, thank you to the Hutchins Center for the investment in state government. I, I've been in elected office since 2002, both as a member of the House and in statewide office, and I can tell you there's a huge gap, especially in states where you have term limits in place. We've lost a lot of policy experts that were previously elected to office. So uh, now some of those gaps are being filled by groups that are doing their own research, but the idea of bringing more emphasis, uh, more research into state government, I think is a good thing. Speaking of term limits, uh, I'm in my second term as state treasurer and final term because I'm term limited. And when Alex, for those that were in here, was giving his report on the behavior of elected officials in office in their second term, I couldn't help but be a little sensitive that I was being psychoanalyzed. <laughs> it is, so this paper is, is exciting to me because in my second term, there is no issue that I've spent more time on uh, than retirement security issues in the public space. Uh, specifically, I serve as a trustee in our state's pension fund. And one of the biggest frustrations as state treasurer is access to quality information and being able to do comparisons. 
Uh, so this, this report uh, and its ability to begin to at least set a foundation for comparing states to states and local governments to different local governments, I think sets an important foundation for all of us. And secondly, I just think there's a tremendous amount of innovation that obviously has been happening in the private sector in this space that ultimately will affect the public sector too, and I think that's an interesting place in this. So I've separated my comments into a, a couple like good news pieces, a couple bad news, and then thoughts for, for further research. First of all, I think one good news piece is on non-pension-related retirement benefits, states have the ability and the flexibility to pretty quickly begin to make changes that, that change that long-term cost structure for that state or that entity. Uh, Missouri is doing that right now with prescription drug costs for retirees, for example. And those changes, while they don't change everything overnight, begin to take effect much quicker and much faster than pension-related benefits. Secondly, I'm, I'm really attracted to the fact that uh, both JP and Alicia used a 6% rate of return uh, as sort of a baseline. Uh, I think that in the public fund space, we really talk about things like taking risk, but we're really not taking risk. We're passing it on to two groups of people, either retirees or, or taxpayers. So the idea of really setting a, a more conservative line in terms of how we evaluate these plans, I think, is, is vitally important. And the other two pieces that I think are, are relatively good news is that, first of all, I agree that the plans that are in true crisis mode are very contained at this point. Um, and that the other piece that I think is important is that when, when they thought about how you determine and how you compare our cost to our revenue stream, Missouri, for example, really only one third of its revenue is general revenue. So when we think about the state's budget, really, and we think about our state pension liabilities, we should be really looking about a third of that total budget in terms of uh, its, its, uh, uh, the amount that we should be looking at in terms of the cost related to pensions. So that's, I think, a really important decision that they made in the research. Uh, I don't think it's overly pessimistic for a state to look at it from that perspective. Um, so on, on bad news piece, there is... Uh, a lot of open amortization periods on non-pension related benefits still, and, and that's obviously an invitation for those never to be really dealt with those liabilities. Uh, majority of those plans still aren't making ARC payments, uh, and still too many plans, I really believe, both in the, in the OPEB space but also in pension side are assuming significantly too high rates of return that we really can't see just from that, that research alone. So a few thoughts and suggestions uh, on research ahead. Uh, again, I thought the 6% number was a great baseline to use, but I think there are a couple other factors that we could begin thinking about when we really evaluate the health of a plan. And for our state's plan and many states' plan during the financial crisis, I think one of those is how we treat things like smoothing, uh, how we dealt with amortization periods, and how we dealt with corridors. Uh, so, for example, a plan like Moser's and many plans like Moser's, during the economic crisis, we widened the corridors to avoid contributing more money to the plan at that point during the downturn. I, I can't help but wonder what these funding levels would look like if plans would have been able to have a little bit more fiscal discipline during those tough times and invest at a point that would have provided really a, a great rate of return for the next five years. I think there could have been some opportunities to really showcase the dip difference that discipline can make. The second piece that interests me is not just the health of a plan, because if a plan is 60% funded, but the state is growing its economy, it's growing its population, the pie is getting larger, I'm not quite as pessimistic about that plan as I would be if that plan is inside of a state where growth is stagnant, uh, lower than average. Uh, mediocre growth, where the population isn't growing in any real way, where that pie essentially is getting smaller relative to other states. So the states that concern me are states that have both of those factors in place, or maybe a slightly higher funding level, but the long-term economics don't look particularly good. And I think that would be something that I know we didn't look at here, but would be an important determinant. The Another piece is uh, we looked at our CAFR in, in Missouri, we don't really consider our teacher's plan a liability on state coffers. Uh, but the legislature does set the benefit level, and uh, that board is appointed often by governors of states. So I really have some sincere questions. If, if a plan is truly in crisis, 
you know, how would that work legally? And we don't have clarity there. But obviously, I think there are, in some cases, some understated liabilities in terms of the state responsibility to step up and ensure the plans that aren't directly under its jurisdiction are adequately funded uh, and maybe adequate benefit levels set. Uh, we talked about the sole source revenues. I think the final piece I'd say is that I'm really interested also in how plan design itself could influence the health of a plan. So if we take all these other factors and set them aside for a moment, for example, would a plan that denies Social Security benefits to participants tend to be less healthy or more healthy than other plans? Uh, would a plan that has uh, a DC benefit as a supplement that might be matched and encourages some sort of savings, do those plans, the DB plans, tend to be slightly more healthy because those individuals are also contributing to a, uh, a DC plan? In other words, some of that pressure is taken off. So those sorts of plan design ideas, I think, are interesting to me from a policymaker because as we think about uh, retirement uh, coming in different phases and looking different through the generations, it's still a relatively new concept uh, that we have here that we're working through in terms of retirement. So the idea that we can constantly be dynamic and redesign these plans is really an important important piece of this. So I'm interested specifically, are there plan design options within these that tend to lead to better behavior, tend to lead to better funding levels, et cetera? Thank you for your great work. Quick question on plan design. I am from Wisconsin. We have a pretty uh, interesting um, design as well. And Mosers has quite a unique, I think, asset allocation. Can you speak to the political um, desire or ability to address plan design and uh, what goes into changing a plan design to make it more beneficial for the long run? You're talking when you said plan design. You're talking about the not just benefit levels, but Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll take asset allocation. Make sure this is working. I'll take asset allocation separately. Uh, I mean, asset allocation, I think, is, is fraught with challenges uh, in terms of the public space. Uh, for example, Moser's up until recently had an, uh, a real return option, a uh, real return assumption of 5.5%, which we recently finally got that reduced, uh, will be reduced to about 4.5%, which is a, right, right at the median. So it's a very aggressive option. I think we all know what happens if boards of directors set very aggressive options. You're going to end up with uh, an asset allocation model that potentially takes on additional risk that those participants aren't necessarily asking for. So I think that's obviously a challenge and a connection point between that rate of return and also that, and that asset allocation. My, my philosophy has been to try to separate the two. Uh, give and empower investment staff the ability to make decisions, to have some flexibility in their investment strategy, but don't tell taxpayers, yes, we think we can hit this number that we have a likelihood of about 38% hitting, right? Actually, give them a number that's much more likely. So try to separate those two pieces. Plan design, uh, you know, I, I, I worry more about plans that exclude Social Security benefits, and I think that's politically the most damaging, challenging uh, issue that we have in front of us in terms of the DV space and the public side goes. You can begin to make changes. If your goal is to reduce state liabilities for the long term, you can make changes over generations to a DB plan, pump up the DC plan, and end up with maybe a more balanced approach, maybe what somebody what might call that a hybrid approach. But on the side where you have all of your benefits tucked into one DB plan, and no Social Security to supplement that. I think that's the bigger political challenge and policy challenge because the benefits are very long term. Can you identify I mean, yourself when you uh, answer the sure, question? Sure, uh, Dave this. Benson from Progressive. Thank you. Um, so the academic literature is fairly consistent in arguing that the correct discount rate uh, is the risk free rate. Uh, can you elaborate on why you think 6% is the correct? discount rate to use for plans? So can we Thanks. start with that? That that whole debate is what number you should use when for reporting purposes. 
um, not for funding purposes. And so it, it's actually been a very sterile debate because people have said riskless rate, rate of return, and we didn't make any progress. And so um, I think that uh, we're sympathetic to using an assumed rate of return uh, for funding. Uh, and that's really what we're looking at here. And then, then our question is, what is an, a re realistic? Uh, because Gatsby does, and I, even the financial economists are, argue for the riskless rate for financial purposes. Also, these plans do not provide riskless benefits because they've, we've seen a lot of cuts in cost of living adjustments and, and other things. Do you want to add? Yeah, I, can say the, I mean, the financial economists, don't, to Alicia's point, aren't, aren't making a case for, for how the system should invest when they talk about the discount rate. They're, they're talking about reporting and valuing liabilities. And so what we're looking at here is how, is basically what kind of return they should, and uh, implicitly investment mix, should they be doing when they're, when they're funding their, their pension system. And that's, uh, in that realm, the kind of 6% number is in line with what a lot of financial economists think is reasonable for the, for the uh, foreseeable future. 6% nominal, right? Yeah, nominal, sorry, no, nominal, yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions. But one really uh, question is thinking about this looking forward. If we really are in a low interest rate environment, like for a really long time, if we're secular stagnation and interest rates are gonna stay really low, then these DB benefits have just gotten really valuable relative yeah. to what every other employee who doesn't have a DB plan uh, is going to have, and it means that we'll be, it'll be harder and harder to, to, to provide them, and maybe we're sort of overcompensating uh, state and local employees. If we used to be the same, and now we're giving them something that's more be, be, uh, valuable, how big of a deal is that going to be, do you think? So you're right. I mean, this, I think the studies today show that when you combine sort of wages and uh, deferred compensation and OPEBs and all that, that the on average, the compensation in the public sector was about the same as in the private sector. But with low rates, the, the DBs become much more valuable. You've got this whole issue of the extent to which you can change future benefits for current workers. And that varies, of course, the, depending on whether the provisions in the Constitution or uh, case law or some other arrangement. And so with some states, you really can't do anything about it. You would have to just slow wage growth. Um, the changes that are usually made at the state level are really for new employees. And our, our concern actually is that uh, the cuts for new employees have been draconian and uh, that you really, the whole deal here, it's not the pension, it's to hire qualified people to teach your children, to police your streets, to do all the real things that need to be done in a, in a community. And so if you cut these as abruptly as they have been, um, I think that the compensation in the public sector is actually gonna fall, will be lower for new employees, even with the low rates. Mm -hmm. But that's a really good question, Louise. <laughs> Question back there. George Friedlander, Citigroup. Um, the, the, looking at all of this from the point of view of technological change, which is one of my hobbies, um, the, there's a, been a fair amount of work recently that the eight to ten largest causes of death in the elderly are under assault from technology, all the way from heart disease down to, to, to things like Alzheimer's and cancer and so on. Um, it's obviously not in the actuarial numbers yet. Um, just any thoughts as to whether you think this is a big deal? Um, and you know, the, there was the, the cover story, I think it was Time last July or so, uh, with, the, with the baby in diapers, this, this baby will live to be 146. Um, I'm not worried about 146 year olds, but I am concerned about, you know, given that it's only a sm relatively small proportion of total life that's post retirement, that that portion may be growing more rapidly than the numbers provide for. So, so I, th I think this issue of life expectancy at 65 is really important. Um, I chaired the technical panel for Social Security, and needless to say, that was a major issue. Uh, this panel recommended that the Social Security uh, actuaries increase their life expectancy projections. Since we made that recommendation, all the data coming in has shown that the rate of improvement 
in more, um, decline in mortality has slowed people and has even flattened out. So on the one hand, you have people saying everybody's going to live to 100. On the other, you have the, the data kind of moving in the opposite direction. This is JP and I did a study um, right. yeah, looking so, at this issue. So we did a study looking at uh, mortality assumptions for state and local plans. It was kind of in the wake of the release of RP 2014 by the Society of Actuaries, for anyone who's in the weeds, as Lisa says. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's used by the private sector, um, private sector DBs when they're valuing their liabilities. And we, we kind of compared state and local plans um, to those new numbers. And what we found is that actually most state and local plans are pretty aggressive with their mortality assumptions. Aggressive meaning they, they assume a, lot of, uh, a decent amount of longevity. They make a lot of adjustments to their tables. They're constantly updating them every five years. Um, and they were actually beyond, uh, in most cases, what the private sector is being asked to use right now. Um, that's still below kind of the best uh, practices, which is this kind of generational approach that really encompasses all your future assumptions for, mortal um, for longevity improvements. But uh, we were surprised and, I mean, happily surprised that state and local plans actually weren't uh, kind of underreporting their liabilities due to mortality in, in, as, as much as we would have expected. Do you agree? Yeah, we, we actually just, uh, as a fund, went through some decision making related to whether we were going to take a, uh, a static versus dynamic approach to our actuarial analysis. So we've gone through that process. We had some uh, conflicting data, so we stuck with the process that we've had in place. I think the bigger policy question actually outside that, though, George, is really for some plans that allow you to retire, for instance, in your late 40s or early 50s, whether that is a rational or reasonable policy decision for taxpayers or, or any organization to make for the Why long Why do you term. wonder about that? It's clearly so, crazy. Right, <laughs> but, we, but we have m many, many plans that are actually right. still doing that. So. Yeah. Right. I, mean, I think all of this speaks to, I mean, all the elements we've discussed in the first question about plan design. I mean, I think what this is highlighting is the risk in a D, risks in the DB, right? Mortality, investment. And so DBs, to this, to this point, especially in the public sector, have been have put all those risks on the employer, and um, that seems to be uh, kind of not not working essentially. Yeah, for taxpayers. Excuse me, taxpayers are right. To put it bluntly, right, it's taxpayers. And so, uh, plan designs going forward have to recognize this risk and either either you know if the employer wants to handle all of it, maybe the the promise has to be lower so that the the volatility around these numbers isn't isn't so much that it it just blows up finances for state and local governments. Or, um, you know, if you're going to aim for these, uh, these benefits, you have to find a way to share the risk between retirees, employees, uh, the taxpayer. And that's being done right now in a, in a kind of post, you know, uh, ex, ex post way after the crisis. You're saying you're seeing cuts to employee, to employee benefits, increases to employee contributions. But there are models out there right now. Wisconsin is a good one at the state level. There's the Dutch systems. There's uh, which is having its own problems. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Canada. Yeah, Canada that are uh, kind of moving the ball forward in terms of sharing risks and having DBs that really um, kind of appreciate the fact that there are these risks in a DB system and how to, how to deal with them. Yeah, just so. following on that, there, there's an argument for gambling, investing some money in equities, but then you should be straightforward and saying we're gambling here. We need to set some rules of um, what we're going to do if we lose. And I think if we can do that, they'll make stand, uh, the plans much more stable. Well, thank you so much. If we have no more questions, I want to thank our panel for being thank here. You. Have a great time. <laughs> Way with your mic. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm sure there was a great panel. I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce to you Alejandro Garcia Padilla, the governor of Puerto Rico. Uh, the governor's been a frequent visitor in Washington for the last several months, uh, and we're really honored that he's willing to come back to, do, to visit with us today. Um, uh, governor Parcia, uh, Garcia Padilla uh, is the only governor of Puerto Rico who was actually educated in Puerto Rico, the only governor who has resided in Puerto Rico his entire life. Uh, he, he, went to, he has a law degree from the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico. And relevant to this audience, I've learned that his wife is actually a CPA. 
which may or may not explain Puerto Rico's fiscal situation. Um, the governor is going to speak for about 15 minutes. I'm going to come back and, and do a brief uh, Q&A with him, and then we'll open it up to all of you. For reporters who are in the room, after the governor is done here, uh, there's a room, a summer's room, where the security guards can show you where he'd be willing to continue the conversation with reporters if you don't get a chance to answer the questions uh, on the stage. Thank you. Governor Padilla. <clears throat> Thank you, David, and uh, about uh, being the first governor that study and just grow up uh, there in Puerto Rico. Uh, you will notice that in my English. So <laughs> uh, it is fitting to be here 10 years after the publication of Brooklyn Collection of Policy Papers on Puerto Rico titled Restoring Growth. That continues to be the seminal question facing the Commonwealth. Puerto Rico has been in the news for many months. Its debt and the risk of a disorderly default with the outcomes it entails, including a humanitarian crisis in the island, has attracted, attracted I'm sorry, the attention of the United States, the Hispanic community from Spain to Argentina and the world. The financial minister of uh, the financial ministry um, of Germany, hosting a visit of Secretary Lou more than a year ago, and feeling the pressure put by Lou regarding Greece, said that he will trade him Greece for Puerto Rico. <laughs> we cannot speak for Greece, but I thank Secretary Lou for his effort on, for us. <laughs> I am sure you may have asked many times how did this situation happen? Was it overlooked? Is it a surprise to Puerto Rico itself and to everybody else? You may be wondering what lesson we could all possibly learn from Puerto Rico and its leadership now that the island begins its path to financial restructuring as well as its recovery and growth. To discuss those questions, I kindly accept the invitation made by Brookings to come here today. It is a fact that Puerto Rico doesn't have the ability to repay the $7 billion, $70 billion debt that was generated by the island's past administration and their creators. Debt must be restructured fairly for both the people of Puerto Rico and the, and the bondholders. A fair solution to the problem is critical in order to bring back progress to the island. States and municipalities across the United States are dealing with some of the same issues Puerto Rico is facing. The need to maintain essential services for their citizens, along with shrinking budgets and reduced federal support. The need to renovate infrastructure to provide health services with its increasing cost to all sectors of the society, to fund public pensions, to secure a competitive education for all students, rich and poor, to fight crime and drug trafficking, and to bring security to neighborhoods, its streets, and homes. That said, not every jurisdiction dealing with debt started with the same scenario. Certainly, Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico's problem have no parallel. Puerto Rico's reality, which preceded the crisis, was unique. For instance, Puerto Rico's industrial base relayed on Section 936 of the Internal Revenue Code, which incentivized U.S. companies to invest in Puerto Rico rather to go to Ireland or Singapore or elsewhere in the world. It was a win-win for both for Puerto Rico, whose people could get good jobs, and the United States, which kept companies at home. Section 936 was, con was co Congress reaction to Puerto Rico's 1970s recession due to the oil crisis, and it worked. Puerto Rico got out of recession back then. But Section 936 was repealed by Congress in 1996, 
with a 10-year phase-out period that end in 2006. And companies decided to go to Ireland, to Singapore, and Puerto Rico lost thousands of industri industrial jobs. The effect of such an industrial construction was brushed under the rug. Industrial income, and this is key, industrial income was substituted by issuing debt. In December 2005, just one year before the end of the phase out of Section 936, our debt was $37 billion dollars. Six years later, in December 2012, it was 70 billion dollars. It nearly doubled. And in January 2013, one month later, I was sworn in. <laughs> the official deficit, according to the uh, government back then, as per document, was 333 million. The reality that came out during the transition process was another one. The deficit was $2.2 billion. And public authorities' debts with the Government Development Bank was even worse, $4.3 billion. To tell you the truth, January 2013, I was about to ask for a vote recount. <laughs> but the law in Puerto Rico does not allow the winner to request a recount. <laughs> I was about to call my predecessor asking him to ask for a recount. The Volcker Alliance has noted that in facing these issues, states have become individual laboratories where innovative experiences are happening on many of these pressing issues. We address similar challenges, and we need to learn from each other what works, what does not, and why, about errors and achievements, about how to reduce the former and replicate the latter, in many ways, Puerto Rico's crisis simply suggests that because of its smaller and simpler economy, it is only ahead of the curve, a curve that looms to many other states and municipalities. We have been forced to try tools that, that have not been tried before. We have had to knock on doors that other jurisdictions may need to approach in a not too distant future. We assessed the magnitude of the crisis that was over us. Possible solutions were in the table. Thus, Puerto Rico could not rely on the same tools available for the states. My administration acted swiftly. Puerto Rico adopted strong austerity measures. The island's budget had been cut by billions during my term. Expenditures have been cut from 11.9 billion in 2012 to 9.1 billion today. We present to the legislature a value added tax alternative that will have imposed a more equal taxation system but ultimately, the bill that passed raised sales, the sales tax to the highest in the United States. The public payroll had been reduced dramatically through attrition. We have deferred other obligations. We, we have withheld tax refunds. Payables to suppliers have also been stretched to over $2 billion. The inability to pay our supplier has resulted in the loss of commercial credit and many services will now be paid on, deliver, on delivery. Without supplier credit, medication, and public hospitals, and air ambulance services to trauma centers were put in jeopardy. These emergency measures are unsustainable, harm 